All right, uh, let's get this show on the road. Hello, everyone. Hope you're well. Welcome to another exciting edition of Math 212, Calculus 2, New and Improved. Uh, we are going to jump right into it. Um, some of the things I'm going to start off today's class talking about things I wanted to get to yesterday, but uh, it's going to be fun. And we are in 10.7. So this is power series and their convergence. Um, although we're really going to talk about convergence in 10.9, which I'm actually going to do last. So I'm going to wrap up 10.7. I'm actually going to touch on something that we would have seen in 10.10. Then I'm going to jump to 10 point. Uh, I'm going to go to 10.8. We're going to talk about Taylor series, and I'm going to skip over 10.9, jump to 10.10. 10.9, most of that is a lot of theory, so I don't really want to get you bogged down by that, especially before the test. So we'll just keep things light, keep things, keep the momentum going, and do more computational stuff and or cool stuff. Not that 10.9 isn't cool, but it's going to be much more theoretical. So let's save that for next week. Let's recap to what we were looking at last time. We saw Oh, I did I didn't realize that it was not known. Um, as far as I know the test is new to 3. And so there's no update on that. Um, so the idea is the window is noon to three and essentially though, you are only going to be given 90 minutes. So if you log in at noon and you take the test, the test is going to close at 1.30. However, you have until three uh, to actually upload scans of your work for the problems that will have to do with you showing work. Um, so the window is pretty much 12 to three. All right, and I'll, I'll send you more information on that, more specific information on that um, later. Um, anyway, so let's actually jump back into it. So we started looking at power series last time. These are a series with this definition here, which at first seems kind of weird, but when you restart writing it out, you realize that, oh, that's just a way to write like a, an infinite polynomial, quote unquote. And uh, because it was just the sum of power functions, an infinite sum of power functions, we call it a power series. Now, the nice thing with power series is that they always make sense in some regard. They will always add up to something meaningful. It's, it's just a matter of where they would add up to something meaningful. So they will always converge. It's just that the question is, are they going to converge at only one point on the real line? namely at the point where x equals x naught, the point where we're centered around, or will they converge absolutely for every possible real valued x? So it converges on the entire real line, or is there some finite length interval on the real line that they will converge? But they're gonna converge either way. A power series is never going to completely diverge. It's either going to converge at one point, converge on the entire real line, or converge on some interval of finite length. Half the length of that interval is called the radius of convergence. This is because the x naught that we have in the formula here, that is going to be the center of the interval and it's going to expand a, an equal distance from that point. And so the distance from x naught to one of the endpoints is called r, that's the radius of convergence. The interval uh, on which the series converges is called the interval of convergence. And it may or may not include the endpoints that are at the extremes of x minus x naught less than r. These are things you have to check uh, for yourselves. So the interval convergence can be any of these four. And we also put in r equals zero and infinity as possibilities. That way we can either obtain the real line or a single point, which is, isn't, isn't an interval in fact. So these are illustrations of all the situations we can have. We can uh, converge at exactly one point. This is when our radius of convergence is zero and the interval of convergence isn't a, an interval at all. It's literally a set with one thing in it. Um, we can converge on the entire real line, meaning no matter when I, no matter what X value I plug in for, for no matter what number I plug in for X, the series, once I write it out, is going to actually converge and make sense. 
how do you get the interval of absolute convergence and conditional convergence? Well, uh, as is mentioned here, the convergence on the on this interval x minus x naught less than r is always absolute. Conditional convergence would come in at maybe the endpoints. So we did an example yesterday. Uh, where were we? Remember this example here? We did that. We found that the main interval was three between three and five. We have absolute convergence there for sure because the ratio test guarantees it. Now we go and we test the endpoints and we realize that at three it converged. However, it converged by the alternating series test, which means the convergence at the point three is actually conditional. At five, it did not converge. So basically what we can uh, get from that is that on the open interval three to five, it converges absolutely. At the point three, it's conditional. So it's conditional, con conditionally convergent at the left endpoint. Um, and at the point five, it's not convergent at all. Um, but in between on the open interval, it's always absolute convergence because we literally use the ratio test to figure this out. Um, so we have auto absolute convergence automatically. Okay. Um, and so interval convergence was that we looked at that and we also saw that if we're looking for the radius of convergence or the interval of convergence, because we really need to know when our series is going to work, when is it going to make sense? We need to figure out some way uh, as to know it's, it's kind of equivalent to say where we want to find the domain of our series. We want to find the set of X values where it's going to actually work and give us something meaningful. Um, and as I mentioned, you always use the ratio test. If you're a Calc 2 student and you're asked this question, it's the ratio test. Always going to be the ratio test. Um, now, we did a few examples. We did one that uh, converged absolutely, but did not converge at the endpoints. We did an example where we converge at one of the endpoints, but not the other one. And once we find the interval of convergence, we know that half the length of that interval is going to be the radius of convergence. You can know what's the length of the interval by taking the right endpoint minus the left endpoint. So for example, if I take five minus three, the result is two. So it means the whole length is two, half of that is one. So you can get the radius of convergence there as well. We did an example that uh, the limit actually went to zero, which is always less than one, which means that it converges all the time. And this is an example that converges on the entire real line. Then we looked at this guy. The series n goes from zero to infinity of x to the n. And I asked, what does that converge to? And remember, if you guys were uh, paying attention, in the how to approach series, I mentioned, uh, if asked what the series converges to, then it's geometric or telescoping. And of course, what was me? No one listens to me. So we fumbled over figuring out that that converge, even though I specifically asked, what does it converge to? Which means you should automatically be thinking geometric because I gave you that in the list of strategies, but whatever, I digress. Let's move on. We figured out it was geometric after much uh, weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. And therefore we could tell what it converged to. In fact, this was a very important idea. This is the uh, opening of Pandora's box. We realized this truth here is actually a harbinger of many, many valuable truths to come. The idea that we can think of a series as a function. And in this case, it only represents the function on this guy, but it is absolutely convergent to the function at all other places. Essentially what we get for this situation is that the series is the function, meaning whatever I can do with the series, I can do with the function and vice versa, as long as I am within this range. Um, so as long as I'm on this green part of the graph, my series and my function are one and the same. It's like someone, it's like someone wrote a half over here and they wrote 0.5 over there. What, it's, it's not different. It's exactly the same thing. You're, you're writing exa you wrote the, exactly the same thing, right? So this started giving us the ideas of maybe we can represent other functions as series and what can we do with that? And we learned that we could represent things like one over three plus X as a series. Uh, we could represent one over three plus X squared as a series. 
We could represent ln of 3 plus x as a series using the fact that we can integrate or differentiate the function. Therefore, we can integrate or differentiate the series. And because it's absolute convergence, the calculus is going to work out. And we ended up with this. We figured out that to write ln of 3 plus x as a series, that is what it's going to look like. And uh, then something amazing happened. We figured out that, hey, we can plug in x values here and figure something out that's really cool. And we finally get to the point where at the beginning when I was telling you about series that the alternating harmonic converts it to minus ln2, and it seemed like, well, that's crazy. Why would it do that? Well, now you have proof. And of course, here the convergence is conditional because this is the alternating harmonic. If I throw absolute values around it, the equation is the equation no longer makes sense. But as long as I don't put any absolute values around it, that is the equation. I can add up an infinite number of terms, minus one, plus a half, minus a third, plus a fourth, minus a fifth, going on forever. And the, it will add up to minus ln2. So that's where we kind of left off last time. Now, here's something cool. Um, and this is, this is the part that is sort of going into section 10.10. .10. But at this point, I think we actually know enough to actually do it uh, because we, we were doing similar things up here. We were actually applying calculus to series. But this is really talking about 10 point, uh, done in 10.10, .10, which we are going to go over again later on today. So here's the thing. Suppose I wanted to compute this integral, right? Compute the following integral. That's the example that's going to lead the discussion for now. Um, integral from zero to one of x over one plus x to the ninth. Right. Now, of course, the insightful among you can immediately see, you know what, there's actually a way for me to compute this by hand. Um, one plus x to the ninth is the sum of two cubes. I can use the formula I learned in algebra class for that to expand and factor that. Then I can do like a partial fractions kind of thing, break it apart, blah, 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 right? So we'll, of course, see that. Everyone sees that. I'm sure everyone sees that um, within a few seconds after looking at it. OK, so let's move on. So now, knowing that I could actually do this integral by hand, I got curious. All right, so let's see what it would actually look like. Let's see how much work I'm in for. So I decided, you know what? Uh, let's actually plug this into Symbol Lab. So I type this into Symbol Lab, and here's the screenshot. I'm like, OK, all right. And then I waited, and you, you have that little a uh, circle that tell you, please wait for the answer. And Symbol Lab is like, cannot solve, boom. All that anticipation for nothing. And I'm like, wow, really? Symbol Lab doesn't know how to do that? I can do that by hand, but whatever. Then I'm like, all right, maybe Wolfram Alpha. Boom. So now Wolfram Alpha could get to the answer, but now, as you can see, it is crazy. And it's not necessarily that Wolfram Alpha is king. I have seen problems that Symbol Lab could figure out that Wolfram Alpha couldn't figure out and vice versa. But we will get to that. I have some comments to talk about. I have a little rant to talk about that afterwards and the importance of knowing how to do things by hand as opposed to doing it in a calculator. Anyway, Wolfram Alpha, whatever the programming behind that is, it could deal with this integral, the indefinite integral. So OK, Wolfram Alpha could deal with it. and. Um, now I'm like, all right, that's the indefinite integral. What is the definite integral? So I plugged that into Wolfram Alpha, and Wolfram Alpha told me, OK, the integral from 0 to 1 of x over 1 plus x to the ninth dx is equal to 0.439285. All right, that's the answer. Now, Wolfram Alpha could get that answer by just using the fundamental theorem of calculus applied to its answer from above. Um, a lot of, I, I, I am aware though that a lot of other computer algebra systems wouldn't have done that. And maybe even here, Wolfram Alpha didn't actually do that. I'm not sure. Um, but there is another way. And that is the way that we are going to explore. So now that's what we're going to do. And by the way, I did type the definite integral into Symbol Lab and it gave me the same thing cannot solve. We cannot compute. And I'm like, does not compute. Okay. It's all right. Now, here comes the fun part. Us, lowly humans, you and I, we are going to figure out what Symbol Lab could not. And we are going to do it without the use of technology. We are going to do it by hand. And we are not going to have to suffer by doing all of this and doing all of that. Of course, I wouldn't do that to you guys. Come on, we're peoples, OK? How do we do this integral? Well, in light of what we did 
yesterday in last class, which hopefully everyone remembers, I can actually use a series here. You see this guy, where are we? See this guy, is equal to this guy. And now I start to envision, uh, you know what, that one over one plus x to the ninth kind of reminds me of something. It looks like one over one over one plus something, one over one plus something. Where have I seen that before? Well, we just learned up here that one over one minus x is something useful as a series. So then, uh, let's actually rewrite that then. All right, so I can actually think of this guy as one over one minus a minus x to the ninth. And so I'm able to use a series in place here. So it's going to be the series n goes from zero to infinity of basically minus x to the ninth to the n dx. So now I just have to integrate this. So this is 0, 1, x, the series, n goes from 0 to infinity. Uh, this is minus 1 to the n, x to the 9, n, dx. Now, of course, I know about integration strategies, so I'm not going to make the mistake of doing something like integrating the x and integrating the series separately, because I know better, and we all know better. So the trick here is to multiply the x inside. So it's supposed to be like, you know, parentheses negative one to the n power times x to the nine n plus one. That's right. what I'm trying to say. So that's that, right? Because as far as the series is concerned, x is a constant, so I can factor it in because the series thinks of n as the variable. Now, I am allowed, because of absolute convergence, I'm allowed to actually switch the series and the integral. And I'm going to do the integral part first, which at this point, that's not bad. I can actually just uh, use the power rule on that guy. So here I'm going to integrate. So minus one to the n is a constant as far as the integral is concerned because it's dx. I am going to add one to the power and divide by the new power. And of course, I'm plugging in zero and one. Now, of course, I'm going to plug in one, and that is going to give me the series n goes from zero to infinity of minus one to the n over nine n plus two. Plug in zero into x, and it's zero. So this is the answer. Now, this is the answer. Okay, that's what Symbol App couldn't figure out. Now you might say, well, all right, so that's the answer, which means you can start uh, actually plugging things in here. Uh, n equals zero, you'd have a half. N equals one, you'd have minus 11. N equals two, you'd have plus one over 20, and et cetera. So this is the answer. This is the answer, and it's, it says it's, when an answer is like this, you have the answer as an infinite series, you say it's not in closed form. You can't really write it in a finite, compact, tight expression. So you say the answer is in, in, in non-elementary form, okay? But this is effectively the answer, okay? So that's the answer. Now, here's the thing. This is an alternating series though. We know how to approximate it. To any desired accuracy. So in fact, with a little bit of patience, I could figure out what symbol lab could not. I can do this by hand and um, it's very possible that Wolfram Alpha did something very similar, as opposed to trying to figure out the calculus of the functions, 
um, and finding it as an indefinite integral first and doing it as a fundamental theorem of calculus. These three calculations here is nothing for Wolfram Alpha to actually do. And then adding up a bunch of numbers, that's what computers are meant for. That's not going to be a big deal either. So now uh, that leads us to here. So this is where uh, we can uh, take away some concluding remarks. So what if I actually wanted to find the answer to the level of accuracy that Wolfram Alpha gave me the answer? Wolfram Alpha gave me an answer to six decimal places, I believe. Well, we know what to do. We would set the an plus one term, right? Which means here I plug in n plus one for n. I would set that less than or equal to my tolerance and solve for n. Now, if I set that less than or equal to 0 0.00, five zeros and a one to make sure that I'm correct up to six decimal places, I would solve for that and n would have to be, I did the calculations earlier, 111,110, which means I need to add up at least 111,111 terms to get my answer to six decimal places, right? Now, on one hand, yeah, if you're a human being, that is a, a major challenge. On the other hand, I could have done this and then add symbol lab to do that because that's something that a computer knows how to do. Adding up 100,000 terms for a computer is it's nothing. It's nothing. Like decades ago, we had computers that could do this in a relatively short amount of time, right? So, you know, I also got curious, okay, what if I didn't need six decimal places of accuracy? What if I wanted to lower my standards? Mm -hmm. It turns out I only need 10 terms to get a two decimal place accurate number. Right? So, in fact, if I were to add a half, take a half and subtract 11, I would get to the answer within two decimal places. And in fact, if I only use two terms, I would get to the answer within one decimal place. Here, if I add two terms, I would get 0 0.409. The actual answer is 0.439, right? So, Conceivably, I, as a lowly human being, could compute this integral and get the answer correct to two decimal places when a very powerful machine, uh, Symbol Lab, which I'm sure is programmed by a lot of smart people, could not figure it out. So at this point, I was like, come on, Symbol Lab, get, get it together, man. Get together. Go study your prerequisites, man. Um, and I mean, it's not, it's not that particular. I know I love Sumo Lab, don't get me wrong. I was just kidding. Um, and I'm sure there are a lot of smart people who, who work uh, uh, at Sumo Lab and, and per, do their programs, but there's obviously a blind spot in the programming here. And, and as you can see, based on series, a human being can fill the blind spot with very little effort. And the, and the part of the effort that I would not want to put in happens to be a part of the effort that a computer can actually handle, even a very primitive computer. So cue the rant. Every now and then you'll have students who in this day and age, they'll say things like, oh, why do we need to know how to do this? I have my calculator, my calculator can do it. I have a TI-89, why do you have to do all this work by hand? They just want to give me long problems and make us fail. Here's the thing, grasshoppers. Here's the life lesson. There is going to come a point where the technology that we have developed up until this point, we are going to reach a problem that that technology cannot solve. What it's going to take is creativity. It's going to take ingenuity. It's going to take people who know what's going on. It's going to take people who know how to do more than just plugging a bunch of number, plug a bunch, press a bunch of buttons on a calculator. Yes, there were people who are very smart at Wolfram Alpha and their program could handle this, but obviously you have equally smart people at Symbol Lab and their technology had this blind spot. Now, imagine if Symbol Lab was the only technology that actually existed and I really needed this answer. How would I get to it? It turns out that it was actually pretty easy to get to it by hand. 
technology is great, but you cannot rely on it. You have to rely on your own self all the time. You have to, this is why you have to improve yourself. You have to learn all you can. You have to build things from the ground up. Make sure that when you know something, you understand it. If it's, if it's important for you to understand it, understand it at a fundamental level. I hear students all the time where they're like, oh, I just want to be an engineer. If I become an engineer, I'm just going to plug this all into a calculator. It's going to be fine. I don't need to know how to do this. And I'm like, man, you're going to be a really bad engineer. Like, a, you might survive right now if you were to get a job. But 10 years down the road, when all the engineering programs have reached their limits, who do you think they're going to lay off first? The guy who can't do anything except with a, a calculator or someone who can figure something out. Okay, here's a problem that we didn't anticipate. Let's figure a way around it. Right? So that's my little rant here. I thought that was a, it was a very cool thing that here's something that is, un, was, it seemed unsurmountable. It seemed crazy. And even, and, even, and, even, and even if I could do it by hand, I could foreseeably do this by hand, but even then, it would have been crazy doing it by hand using what I learned before, but I don't only know the knowledge about what I learned before. I also know the knowledge about series. And this is another thing. So a lot of times students will be like, well, I already know one method for doing this thing. Why do I need to learn another method? Why do I need to learn how to do it this way when I learned it that way? Oh, Javon, that's confusing me. I learned it a different way in high school. Learn as many methods and as many perspectives as you can, because you never know when what, what knowledge is going to come in it become important. And by the way, this is not just something I'm saying about math. In all your classes, you might think of like your English literature class as a waste of time or your government class as a waste of time. No knowledge is a waste of time. Absorb everything as much as you can reasonably do. You never know when some piece of knowledge is going to come into use. You never know. And don't rely on someone else doing it for you or technology doing it for you. Sometimes creativity is what's needed. And even if you, you say, oh, well, you know, AI is going to solve all our problems of the future. Well, you're going to need someone smart enough to program the AI and <laughs> teach the, and tell the AI how to go about learning something. So I thought that was a cool application and uh, I checked it with Symbolab and I was quite surprised that Symbolab couldn't figure it out. Wolfram Alpha, whatever the programming behind that is, could do it. Um, but yeah, you'll have a, you'd have problems like these time to time. So pay attention, grasshoppers. Remember all you learn and don't think of any knowledge that you gain as useless. The people who say, oh, I went to college, I didn't learn anything, I never used it in my life. Those people are misguided. Those people just don't have anything really important going on in their lives where they actually need creativity. You guys have to be different. You guys are going to be the future. You guys are Javon students. You guys need to know what is going on. And that is today's life lesson taught by an integral. Okay, so I thought that was interesting. Yeah, I, I, could, I could, I mean, adding these two fractions, I'm already two, uh, within close to the answer by one decimal place. I think that's amazing. And it's amazing that the technology couldn't handle it, but uh, hey, you have the ingenuity, you don't need the technology. Or you just need the technology to do the grunt work. So at this point, I, I hear people saying, but Javon, yes, proverbial student. What if we're looking at a function that we can't connect the, the one over one minus x to, right? What if I wanted to talk about an integral that's like sine of x cubed? What if I wanted to compute the integral zero to one of e to the minus x squared, which for any of you who have done applied math, you'd realize that that particular integral is super important to things like probability and statistics. So that's not even a completely random example. Uh, e to the minus x squared, if you, if you tweak the, the coefficient of x a little bit, you get the bell curve, which is the normal distribution. It's a very important function, e to the minus x squared. Knowing how to deal with that is actually pretty important. Knowing how to find the error under that curve is pretty important. Uh, applied mathematics would be lost if we couldn't do that, right? 
However, how are you going to, so we saw earlier that I could uh, use what I know about one over one minus X squared to figure out one over three plus X. I could figure out what ln of three plus X looks like. But how in the world am I going to connect one over one minus X to a sine function? How am I gonna connect that to an exponential function? How can I use that to figure these guys out? Well, I'm glad you asked proverbial student. That actually leads very nicely into the next section. So that brings up the idea of Taylor series. A very important kind of series. What I showed you last class was how do we develop a power series for new functions when they are similar enough to all other functions that I already know power series expansions for. Then yeah, I can use the one over one minus X. I'm actually not gonna talk about convergence here. Originally I planned to do it, but I'm, I'm not gonna do it anymore. Um, originally I used that, the fact that I know about the series for one over one minus X to figure out the series of other things, right? But what if I have no idea? I don't know a series that connects me to the exponential or a sine function or any other crazy function. How can we build up a power series from scratch, quote unquote? How can I get to a point where, you know what, give me a random function, I can figure out the power series. That's what we are going to talk about now. That is what Taylor and Maclaurin series are. This is one of the games in town that, it come, what, that we can come up with. It's one of the most, uh, common ways to actually do this process. How do you figure out a power series for a function that you don't really know another power series that it can connect to straight for, in a straightforward manner? Okay, so here's how we're going to do it. And we're going to kind of take a, a differential equations approach out of it. We're going to pretend that we have the answer and then kind of work backwards to see what would that answer necessarily have to look like. So suppose I have a function and I can write it as a power series, okay? What would that power series have to look like? So here I set f of x equals to this power series, which means the x minus x naught is just going to be a part of it. That's what gives it its polynomial behavior. What I need to figure out is the CNs. What are the coefficients of the polynomial, of the infinite polynomial that will represent this function? Okay, that's what we're gonna figure out. So here, observe grasshoppers. Here's how we're going to do it. Let's start, and, and I can do this with the series as well, but I'm, I'm going to write this out uh, so you can kind of, it, it will be easier, I think, to see what's going on. So, so let's pretend that I could write my function as a power series. So it's uh, C0 plus C1x minus x naught plus C2x minus x naught squared plus C3 X minus X naught cubed plus C4, I'll stop at the fourth, X minus X naught to the fourth plus dot, dot, dot. You get the idea, right? Let's pretend I could actually do that. How can I figure out the C's? Well, you might notice here that we do have a low hanging fruit. I can actually figure out one of these C's pretty easily. Notice that if I plug in uh, maybe I'll want to do this in a different color. Stay blue. Notice that if I were to plug in f of x naught, what's going to happen? Well, all the x minus x naught, they will go to zeros because I have x minus x naught and I'm plugging x equals x naught. So all of those guys are going to go into zeros except the first guy. So that gives me the first guy. So my first coefficient, c sub zero, that is going to be given by the function that I care about evaluated at x naught, the point where the series is centered. Now here is how we're gonna figure out the other guys. How would I get those guys? I realize if I want to plug in x naught again, it's going to kill everybody else except c zero. Can I get to the other guys in a different way? Well. Look at what's going to happen if I differentiate it. The C0 is gonna go away, which is fine because I already solved for it. The derivative of the first term is going to be C1 plus two C2 X minus X naught. Of course, by the chain rule, you'd multiply by a one, but we don't need to show that. Three C3 X minus X naught squared 
4c4 x minus x naught cubed plus da da da. And now you might realize, hey, we can actually play the same game again. Let's plug in f prime of x naught. That is going to give me c1. Ah, all right. So here I have c1 is equal to f prime of x naught. Now you might think, oh, are all the c's just going to be all the derivatives evaluated at uh, x naught? Well, not so quick. Uh, we do need some more to try to find a pattern here. What I'm going to do though, uh, because derivative was uh, uh, useful last time, let's do a second derivative. Now I'm going to get 2c2 plus 3 times 2c3. And there's a reason why I didn't write that as 6, because I want you to be able to see a pattern. Plus 4 times 3, x. Plus 4 times 3, c4, x minus x naught squared. The next one would be like 5 times 4, c5. Let, let me move the chat box out the way here. Five C five X minus X naught cubed plus dot dot dot. Now notice that my F double prime evaluated at X naught will actually give me uh, two C two, which means I can solve for my uh, C two. This is actually going to be the second derivative evaluate x naught divided by two. Okay, so uh, the pattern that I originally thought isn't working out. Um, obviously, there's going to come a point where we're going to have to divide by some stuff. Let's actually do one or two more derivatives, and then I'll ask you guys if you can see the pattern. The third derivative, this would be three times two C three, plus four times three times two C four x minus x naught plus, 5 times 4 times 3 c5 x minus x naught squared plus dot dot dot. I can plug this in. F triple prime evaluated at x naught is going to be 3 times 2 c3, which means I can solve for my c3. F triple prime of x naught divided by 3 times 2. Let me do one more. Fourth derivative. This is going to be four times three times two C four plus five times four times three times two C five X minus X naught. You'll notice that the next term would give you six times five times four times three times two. Uh, no, not, there's no two here. C6, x minus x naught squared plus dot dot dot. Plug this in. F to the fourth derivative evaluated x naught will give me four times three times two C4, which means uh, my C4 is going to look like this. Okay, so here is the moment of truth, dot, dot, dot. Suppose I could do this in general. Do you see a pattern that will give me the CN? It is a cheeky hint, thank you, if I say so myself. I do do this for a living, believe it or not. I know it looks like I just, I'm fresh off the boat, but yeah, there, there are times when I, I know leaving it at six would just like totally throw a lot of people for a loop, leaving it as leaving uh, the constants out. And by the way, that's a pro tip for the future. Um, if you ever need to build up to some sort of pattern, it is actually better to leave things essentially unsimplified so you can see the inner workings. 
All right. Now let's look at these. C0 is f of x naught. C1 is f prime of x naught. C2 is uh, f double prime x naught over 2. C3 is f triple prime x naught over 3 times 2. C4 is f to the fourth prime of x naught. Do we see the pattern for the CN? Right, it's actually, notice that the denominators were factorials. Notice that essentially I could do this over zero factorial. I could do this over one factorial. Now, of course, the two is the same as two times one. And so that is going to be F double prime over two factorial. Um, this guy, three times two, I can append a, a one move the chat box again. And this is going to be f triple prime over three factorial. This one, again, I can append with a one. And I can think of that as f to the fourth prime evaluated x naught over four factorial. This ultimately leads me to this general pattern for every cn. It is going to, the coefficient will be given by the nth derivative evaluated at the point where the series is centered about, divided by n factorial. And that is the golden ticket, ladies and gentlemen. That is how, if I were to build a series from scratch, using the knowledge of a Calc 1 student, that's how we would do it. Okay. This leads to what we call a Taylor series, right? So this guy, this means is, now th there's something that I want to uh, make you aware of here, but F to the N evaluated X factorial at X naught over N factorial times X minus X naught is going to be our series. Now this part here, this is something that we need to discuss in 10.9. Uh, not always equal. I know we started out that way, but it turns out that there are, uh, stay tuned. We're gonna discuss this in 10.9. However, this seems like a very naive and promising way Wait for the next exciting episode of 212. Okay, right, so we'll, we'll get to that later on. But for now, this seems like a very promising thing. This leads to what we call the Taylor series. That's what this is called. It's called the Taylor series for the function f of x. Now, if we actually plug in the x naught equals zero, specifically uh, the number zero, zero specifically, if we set x naught equals zero, we call it a Maclaurin series. So a Maclaurin series is just a Taylor series centered at zero. We just call it by another name, right? Normally when you say Taylor series, you have to mention, oh, Taylor series centered at this point. Taylor series centered at five. Taylor series centered at one. Taylor series centered at seven. Whenever the Taylor series is centered at zero, it's centered at the origin, we just call it a Maclaurin series. And then you don't have to say where it's centered. You just say, oh, it's the Maclaurin series. Everyone knows, oh, he's talking about the Taylor series centered at zero. Now, there are some caveats here. When is finding a Taylor series possible? Well, for one, you must notice that technically what I'm doing, I kept differentiating. So in order for it to even be possible to find such a thing, my function has to be infinitely differentiable. I have to be able to take derivatives and derivative and derivative and do this forever. Another thing is, for the series to even make sense, I cannot allow the coefficient to get too big. If this guy gets so big that if I throw it in the ratio test, it gives divergence except at one point, that's, uh, that's an issue. So one, f must be infinitely differentiable, and two, the f to the nth 
derivative over n factorial should not get too big so that you diverge when you throw it in the in, you diverge for uh, for all but one point when you throw it in the ratio test all right so those are two things those are two things that make it possible to find the taylor series now as for how useful that series is and whether or not you can use that series to replace a function like we were doing earlier that's a whole other consideration right so this here, this is a necessary but not sufficient condition to be able to find the Taylor series, uh, or at least a useful Taylor series. Um, but that leads us to the first major definition here, and it is one that you should know. Da, 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 da. Let f be a function with derivatives of all orders throughout some interval, and suppose x naught is a point in that interval, then the Taylor series generated by f at x equals x naught is given by that series right there. The Maclaurin series, which is simply the Taylor series when x equals zero, parenthetical statement, because you wouldn't really say it, it kind of goes without saying, is just going to be uh, the series f to the nth derivative evaluated at zero over n factorial x to the n. Now, to go back to what I was saying earlier, I want you to realize if you are paying attention, that I was very careful not to write f of x equals this, or you know, f of x equals that. I was very careful not to write the f equals part here. And it wasn't because I forgot to type it. It's because there are times when even though I use this function to generate a series, the Taylor series cannot represent the function. The series and the function will behave too differently, right? Um, that being said, again, that's something that we'll get into 10.9. Uh, right now, what I want to do is actually compute some series. Here are some familiar functions, and you'll notice that, uh, hey, if I know a Taylor series for that, that would be very useful in computing something like the integral of e to the minus x squared. Or if I know the series for this, hey, that might be useful in computing an integral like sine of x cubed. Hmm, hmm. Obviously, Javon must have a reason why he's showing me this. Okay, so let's actually do that. So I do want you to see construction from scratch, how you would actually construct, build a series from scratch. So um, no indication of what a power series for this guy would look like, or if one even can work or anything of that sort. However, let's take our, the cue from what we did before. So I want to find a Maclaurin series, which means x naught equals zero. So this means I need to find a bunch of things. Well, I need to find, uh, of course, my f of x is going to be e to the x, which means f of zero is one. f prime of x is, well, c to the x. So f prime of zero is one. f double prime of x is e to the x. f double prime of zero is one. I think we're kind of getting the idea here. F to the nth derivative isn't going to change. It's going to be e to the x. And then if I find f to the nth derivative evaluated at zero, it's always going to be one. This tells me that my cn is going to be f to the n evaluated at zero over n factorial, or in this case, cn is equal to one over n factorial. So I can now go back to my, my Maclaurin series form. And I can plug in one over n factorial x to the n. Right, because I'm just using this formula right here. x to the n over n factorial, and that's the right answer though? Using this. Yes, and I can rewrite this. I can multiply across. This is x to the n divided by n factorial. That's what I said, x to the n power over n factorial. Yes. What happens if a student doesn't add now, include like, you know, n equals zero, the sigma to infinity? What's gonna happen? You lose points. Lose points for moves yes. for missing that? Yes. Now, 
you might have noticed something, maybe, maybe not. Uh, but if we go back to yesterday's class, you might notice something. Uh, where was it? I know I did it somewhere. X to the N. Find that, boom, did that. Oh, look at that. X to the N over N factorial. Look at Javon with the foreshadowing, jeez. Man, right? This is like one of those Easter eggs. 10 things you missed on the last episode of 212. Look at that. We already dealt with that series. We actually already know what the radius of convergence and the interval of convergence is. Right? So we saw last class, so we don't have to do it here. We saw last class that the ROC, at, the ROC was equal to infinity here, and the IOC was equal to the entire real line. So it turns out that this series is the Maclaurin series for e to the x. So that guy looks innocent as he does. He is actually connected to the function e to the x. Hmm. And the plot thickens. I mean, this is like uh, you're watching some TV show and, uh, and, a, and a plot point that you thought was insignificant suddenly starts coming into play. That's the McLaurin series for e to the x. Let's look at the one for cosine of x. Okay, what did we do here? Okay, well, uh, again, I want the McLaurin series, so I know I'm centering at zero. F of x equals cosine of x, which means f of zero equals one. Uh, f prime is going to be minus sine x, F prime of zero, well, that's zero. F double prime is equal to minus cosine x, which means F double prime of zero equals minus one. Okay, is there gonna be a pattern I can figure out here? Let's see. F triple prime is going to be positive sine x, which means F triple prime evaluated at zero, is zero, because sine of zero is zero. F to the fourth prime is cosine. Hold on, wasn't that where we started? All right, so F to the fourth of zero is one. And notice it's gonna just repeat here. All right, so I need to figure out a pattern, a way to write this. So, all right, what can I realize here? Well, there are a bunch of zeros. Uh, in a, if I'm writing out a series, the zeros kind of don't matter if the coefficient is zero. It's like I'm adding zero. Why would I write this plus zero and that plus zero plus this plus zero plus that plus zero plus this plus zero? Kind of a, so what I'd want to do is uh, ignore in the series. All right. So I want to find a pattern for the non-zero guys. So the first one starts at one. The next one starts at, then the next one is minus one. Then the next one is one. Now this pattern is going to repeat. So the next one will be minus one. Then the next one will be one. Then the next one will be minus one. Then the next one will be one. Uh, can we think of any pattern that looks like that? One, then minus one, then one, then minus one, then one, then minus one. Alternating, uh, how can you write down a formula for it though? Right, this guy behaves like minus one to the n, but only on the even derivatives. Which means uh, I want so this basically means here, 
cn looks like minus one to the n over n factorial. Or let's say, I don't wanna reuse the same thing because they might not be the same. Let's say minus one to the k over n factorial, but n only allowed to be even. Now here's how you would kind of express that idea. Uh, you should know. And this is something for the future, I guess. FYI, even means, uh, so let's say K K is even means k equals 2n for some integer n. The definition of what it means to be even is to be a double, double some other integer. And k is odd means k is equal to 2n plus 1 for some integer n, right? So odd integers are precisely the ones that can be written as 2n plus 1. So 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, et cetera. Those can all be written in the form 2n plus 1. Also the negatives, minus 1, minus 3, minus 5, going on forever. Um, the even ones are the ones that can be written as 2 times some integer, which in fact is why 0 is an even integer. Um, for some reason, a lot of people are unaware of this. 0 is an even integer. Um, you can write it as 2 times 0. So zero plus or minus two plus or minus four plus or minus six plus or minus eight, et cetera. These guys are all even. So if I want to make sure I'm alternating on the evens, all I need to do is write my guys in my series formula with two n's instead of n. So this kind of means that the McLaurin series for cosine is well, instead of n factorial, I'm going to put 2n factorial. That guarantees that I have 0 factorial, 2 factorial, 4 factorial, 6 factorial, 8 factorial. And then I alternate on each one of those guys. And then I'm only looking at the even powers as well. Because all the odd powers are going to be going with the sine function. All the even powers are going to be going with the cosine function. And um, equals because, 0 to infinity. Yes. Yes, I, I was. I was Every time when it comes to power series and getting the final answer, is it always n equals zero sigma infinity? Usually, yes. Yeah, usually. A power series starts at zero. Um, now, you might have a situation where it's not written so that it starts at zero, but you'll be able to shift it there or something like that. But it, it starts at zero theoretically. Now, here's another thing just to give another. Uh, something that was foreshadowed years ago. You learned back in algebra class that cosine was an even function and sine was an odd function. Remember that? And the even function was symmetric about the y-axis and the odd function was symmetric about the origin. Now you have new meaning to that. Notice that the cosine is the guy that controls the even terms and the sine is the guy that controls the odd terms. In the series for a cosine, only the even powers of x are present. Gives new meaning to the phrase, it's an even function. Right? A lot of times students were looking at this back in uh, algebra class and they were like, well, how would I know it's even? Because you know, I, want, I feel like the power should be even for it to be even, but cosine doesn't even have any powers. Oh, well, you just didn't have it, the, the language at the point to express it in even powers. Right? Now, you notice that the cosine is an even function. It, it works on the even terms and it's zero on all the odd terms. Similarly, by the way, uh, the sine function will, will have a very similar pattern. It's going to bounce between cosine and sines. Uh, similarly, the max, max series for sine is, it's going to be like a series, but now it only works on the odd ones, minus one to the n over two n plus one factorial times x to the 2n plus 1. 
gives new meaning to what it means to say sine is an odd function. And you know what? If you go back to your algebra class and you look at every function that you saw where your professor told you, it's neither odd nor even. If you were to write the power series of those functions, you would realize that it have both odd and even terms. That's why we can't say they're one or the other. However, if you go back to algebra class and find the power series of all the even functions, you will notice that their power, power series only has the even powers of x is present. The odd functions only has the odd powers of x is present. And this results in symmetry about the y-axis for the even functions and symmetries about the origin for the odd functions. Boom, more foreshadowing. Now we're becoming enlightened, slowly but surely. A lot of things over the years where we're like, what, what is all this important? Where is all this going? We're starting to see it unfold. Now, yes, we're in Calc 2. We're still at the very beginning of the journey. You will be doing many more math classes before you realize what the real point of it all is, which is just another thing I could rant about. Uh, people are always talking about, oh, you're never going to use the math in your life. I think math is useless. It's like, dude, the highest you went is calculus. You never got to the point where math becomes useful. You never got to the point where you can actually see how it's working in, you know, unless you actually really look for it. Yeah. What, are we, uh, what is the point? Where's this all going? Uh, are we there yet? Right? Trust yeah. me, you, you'll, you'll eventually get there. <laughs> now, that leads us to this table right here. Boom, boom, boom. Curl up a little bit. Boom. Up a little bit. Give me Curl a second, a Jason. Give me a second. I'm moving stuff. I'm moving stuff. You'll get a chance to copy. I didn't want to copy. I'm just moving it up. All right, now this leads us to, boom, this table right here. Can it all fit? Now, I just derived for you uh, well, we've derived three of these guys, one, two, and three. The derivation for the sine x is very similar, so I'm not going to do it. Uh, but we use the geometric series to derive the fact that one over one minus x can be written as this series, n goes from zero to infinity of x to the n. We saw that the radius of convergence was one and the interval of convergence was mi minus one to one, not including the endpoints. e to the x is that function x to the n over n factorial. The radius of convergence is infinity and the, which we should have found for up here. Um, let me just mention here before, uh, use ratio test. I mean, always, obviously, <laughs> to find ROC and IOC. You will realize that you actually get, it, it works on the entire real line. So, okay, back to this table. Now this table, and you can take a screenshot of it because we're actually going to use it in, uh, later on in a little bit. Um, power series you're expected to know by these heart. These are power series you're expected to know by heart. It's hard. Right? You're going to have to have these memorized. So it's and supposed to be hard, way, not heart. <laughs> huh? It's supposed to be hard, not heart. <laughs> Uh, well, the actual phrase is hard, but I, I can see if you're using a pun. It's not, <laughs> it's not gonna. <laughs> okay. Okay. So these guys are guys you should know, right? The power, the power series for one over one minus X is the series N goes from zero to infinity of X to the N. That's the radius of converts interval converts. E to the X is a series N goes from zero to infinity of X to the N over N factorial. Um, the cosine is this series, the sine is that series. For the e to the x, the cosine and the sine, they converge everywhere, absolutely, right? And for the first function, the one over one minus, um, for one, one over one minus x, uh, that converges only absolutely on the open interval from minus one to one. And it's more than possible to memorize these. Uh, you can do it in a relatively short time if you wanted to. So don't make excuses for yourselves. Okay. 
here's something even cooler. And this is something that I'm not, uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm not going to fully justify yet, and technically not really ever in this class, but I will mention some theory as to what is the background of this. Um, for each of the functions above, the power series converges to the function. Essentially what that means is I'm allowed to write, they are equal to these series. I can write one over one minus X equals the series X to the N, uh, the sum of X to the N as N goes from zero to infinity. I can write E to the X as the series X to the N over N factorial as N goes from zero to infinity. I can write cosine as this series. I can write sine as this series. Right? And it turns out, in many cases, it's actually a lot more efficient, a lot nicer to actually think of these functions in their series form. If you were to ask an algebra student, what do you think is y equals e to the x? They'll say, oh, it's an exponential function. I, I know the picture looks like this. You ask a calculus student, what do you think of e to the x? Well, I know it's an exponential function. The picture looks like this. I know it goes to infinity as x goes to infinity and it goes to zero as x goes to negative infinity. I also know that it's its own derivative. It is the only exponential function that is its own derivative. Ask a mathematician what is e to the x. The mathematician is going to tell you it's the sum from n goes from zero to infinity of x to the n over n factorial. This is the way you want to think about it. So before, um, I gave you the limit definition for the uh, definition of e to the x. Limit as, uh, so by the way, also e to the x equals the limit as n approaches infinity of one plus x over n uh, to the one to the n, right? Now, the math news will think of e to the x as this limit, right? Now, of course, the veterans will also realize that that limit would give you e to the x. But the really hardcore mathematicians, they don't think of e to the x as a limit. They think of it as a series. And it's, it's very efficient and it's very useful. And I will talk about this later and I will do some hand wavy justifications of this. But for these four series, the ones that I ask you guys to memorize, the series quote unquote, converges to the function, meaning they are equal, meaning they are one and the same, meaning it's just two different ways of expressing the same thing. Kind of like how someone can say a half and someone can say 0.5. And if you write it on paper, it looks kind of different, but really it's exactly the same. There's no difference between the two. E to the X is that series. That's what it is, right? You'll notice also from the graph, it's neither even nor odd, which of course makes sense. The power series has both even and odd powers, et cetera. These guys are their series, okay? Now, um, I just want to do a little demonstration for you that hopefully is going to convince some of you of that fact. So you're saying, these guys are their series. Anything I can do to the series, I can do to the function and vice versa and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, yeah. Okay, well, I know that the derivative of sine is cosine. If I take the derivative of this series, will I get that series? Yeah, yeah, that, that, yeah, exactly. In fact, I'm gonna do that for you right now, right? So instead of going by the limit definition for the derivative of sine, let's actually write this as a series. I know that sine is minus one to the n, uh, x to the two n plus one over two n plus one factorial. All right, it's absolutely convergent. In fact, it's absolutely convergent on the entire real line. Which means this is just going to be the series and yes, this n goes from zero to infinity. Of this. Okay, how do I differentiate that? Well, power rule, of course. Uh, so I bring down the 2n plus 1, so it's that. The 2n plus 1 comes down, subtract 1 from the power. Ah, look at that. So this 2n plus 1 is going to cancel that 2n plus 1, 
And then we're just going to be left over with 2n factorial. Hmm, what is that guy? Would you look at that? That's the guy for cosine. Now, some of you might remember uh, the derivation of the derivative of sine fun the sine function from calc one, where we used the limit definition and you had to remember the addition formula for sine to fully expand it. Then you had to remember the special limit theorems that sine x over x goes to one as x approaches zero and all that good stuff. And you can use that to get here. Now, the person who's well versed in series may very well prefer this definition. That was easy. I can clearly see that the definite, the derivative of sine is cosine. So that's just a limit demonstration. It's not exhaustive by any means. But uh, I don't know, I'm already pretty convinced that whatever I can do with the series, I, whatever I can do with the function, I can do with the series. The functions and the series, they are the same, right? And any relation that the functions have between each other, the series, the corresponding series will have that relationship between each other as well. Okay, now I do want to point out the fact that this is not always going to happen. Uh, what did I just do? I'm just moving it. I do want to point out the fact that this is not always going to happen. It's not all the time when you find a power series using Taylor's uh, formula that you get a series that completely represents the function in this way, that you can kind of replace the function with the series and no one's going to know the difference. Like you could, they could literally swap positions, right? Like if, if, if I go back, I want you to appreciate that if I went back through all my old notes from algebra class and everywhere where I saw a sign, I wrote the series instead and everywhere I see cosine, I wrote the series instead, and everywhere I see e to the x, I wrote the series instead, nothing would change nothing at all right the series is the function okay whenever a taylor series converges to the function it means that the series is the function okay however it turns out that's not going to always happen it is possible that i can use a function and create a power series but the power series ends up being very different from the function that i started with um, it's possible that the power series will diverge except for one point it's possible that I cannot even create the Taylor series in the first place. I start getting undefined coefficients. It's possible for the series to be created. However, it converges to some completely different function. It behaves like some other function other than the f of x that I started it with, right? That's all possibilities. And I'll show you guys some examples of that when we go through uh, 10.9. For now though, just be aware of that. So just be aware of that possibility. Just know the above functions and the corresponding series are one and the same, but this does not always happen. Sometimes you create a Taylor series and it's just not a useful approximation. Now we'll can discuss the convergence in 10.9 and we'll talk about that issue and issues like that. But I kind of want to actually jump forward to 10.10 .10 because there's a lot of computational coolness that happens in that section. So we're gonna jump there. And by the way, this is, I just posted here. I'll just leave this right here because a student from my class last semester asked me, well, what would, how, what would the Maclaurin series for a tangent look like? Could I divide one series by another? And then technically, yes, you could. The algebra might not be one you'd want to do though. So I gave several links that showed several different methods to develop the uh, Maclaurin series for tangent. To be fair, uh, Quote, I'm just being open right now. I'm, I'm never gonna ask you to find the Maclaurin series for tangent. So this is just uh, if you're curious, right? So I, I mentioned here, I won't ask you about this. I'm not gonna ask you about the Maclaurin series for tangent. What about the ln x? Yes, I could ask you that. You can, because you can generate that based on a series that I gave you before. So for example, the derivative of ln x is one over x. And then I can write one over X as one over one minus 
parentheses one minus x and then use the one minus x as the r in a geometric series and i can create a series for l and x pretty easily right i don't even need taylor's formula to do that um so you don't have to mem the only ones you have to memorize are these however using techniques that i gave i showed you guys yesterday and using the technique of taylor series here you should be able to create the power series for other functions as well that's something that we'll get into more uh, later. But that's, that's it. That's the intro to Taylor series. Essentially, this is a way that the mathematician Taylor came up with uh, to generate power series that correspond to any function, how to build up a power series from scratch. Now, it turns out sometimes something amazing happens and the power series actually can represent the function. You could replace the function with the power series and no one can tell the difference. However, unfortunately, it does not always happen. Um, but for the important ones that I ask you to memorize, it does happen. These guys are equal. This is equal to that. And this is equal to that. And this is equal to that. And this is equal to that. They are one and the same. Knowing one is the same as knowing the other. Graphing one is the same as graphing the other. Plugging in an x value into one is the same as plugging in an x value into the other. Differentiating one is differentiating the other. Integrating one is the integral of the other. They, they are, they're, they're exactly the same. There is no difference. And that kind of ends what uh, we wanted to cover in 10.8. So like I said, 10.9 is gonna talk about the convergence of Taylor series. When they converge, what do they converge to? And when does their convergent represent the function that started them. Um, but that's a lot of theoretical mumbo jumbo. So we're actually going to jump into some applications. Now, the most important application, again, full disclosure, is this one. Using Taylor series to evaluate uh, elementary integrals, non-elementary integrals, right? So difficult integrals. So if you, if you go down to the bottom, yeah, so here I have some integrals that these guys are actually impossible to do by hand. There's that important guy again, integral from one, zero to one of e to the minus x squared. You can literally now, you actually know enough because we actually did it. Uh, just replace this guy with the series and you can actually do the computation. So um, technically I already taught you the main application that I need to teach you here. But I think that there are some other cool things to talk about that I already wrote in. Um, so I just want to actually talk about them. Um, but again, the first four things technically you're not responsible for, but I just want to talk about them. I'll do it very quickly. For some of them, I even wrote in what I would have written for you guys anyway. I did this with my, I did this stuff with my class in the spring, but it's the summer. So we're, we're essentially going to skip them, but I do want to say a few words. So while there's one about there's one application that we really want to get a handle on for this section, that is application number five, I do want to mention four other applications. I also want to mention the fact that this is just a drop in the ocean. Series are so useful, uh, more than I can show right here, it's not even funny. But these are just some of the things that your textbook talks about and some things that I actually want to mention. Uh, just some honorable mentions here. The first is Euler's equation and the most beautiful equation in mathematics. We're going to learn what that is today. The generalization of the binomial theorem. We're going to learn finally how to expand the radical. Uh, so students have done it for many years. Many have tried and failed. I'm going to show you guys how to do it. At least I'm going to tell you how to do it. I'm not really going to show you. Computing limits. Are we going to have this on our exam? Jason, you have to listen to what I'm saying. Sorry. The first four applications you are not going to be tested on at all. I'm talking about them just because I think they're cool. The fifth application is the one that you should, will be tested on. And I already showed you how to do that. Okay. So, uh, writing important constants as infinite sums, which seems like it would be a pointless thing, but it's actually pretty important at the end of the day and computing limits. Uh, there are things that are better than L'Hopital's rule. There are things that when we have very complicated limits, applying series to these limits can help, them, help us simplify them and get away with uh, 
very complicated limits. So I'll show you some of those. Um, first one, let's actually talk about Euler's equation a little bit, um, because if you're a math student, you should know what this is. All right. You can watch uh, this. This is just a YouTube video, a very short one, about uh, a very famous uh, professor from Carnegie Mellon geeking out over this equation. But uh, yeah, good old Euler, right? <laughs> Euler, uh, he came up, there's an equation that's named after him. Um, however, Euler is one of those mathematicians, very prolific. Um, he is one of the few mathematicians of antiquity who made very important contributions right into his old age. In the past, most mathematicians who have contributed anything great, they did it when they were very young and then not much happened after that. Um, mathematician, mathematics was thought of as a young man's game for a long time. It's no longer, that's no longer the case. Um, but uh, it's, for a long time it was. Euler was an exception. Even into his old age, he was crunching out theorems to the point where this day, technically, if you say Euler's equation or Euler's formula, most math people would ask, which one? Which one do you mean? Because there's tons of formulas named after this guy. Even E in E to the X was named after this guy, Euler. The E from E to the X is named after Euler. So he has an equation that involves the imaginary unit. It is the number that when you square it, you get minus one. It, by attaching this to a real number, you can get a complex number and so on. Now, of course, the assumption here, which at first seems really crazy, but we had to make this definition so that we could solve a bunch of equations. Uh, if i is the square root of minus one, you pretend that's actually an answer and it's actually a number. Then if you multiply by, by i, both sides, uh, i squared is going to be minus one. Multiply that equation by i, you get i cubed is minus i. Multiply that equation by i, you get i to the fourth is one. Multiply that equation by i, you get i to the fifth is i, and this pattern repeats. Okay, so we cannot find all powers of this number i, the number such that when you square it, you get minus one. Now, this is a number that comes up a lot in applications, the exponential raised to uh, an imaginary number, e to the i x, right? Now, it turns out we can use series to explore this number. So notice here, if I have e to the i x, I can think of this as a series. Right? This is the series of x to the n over x fact n factorial, where my x here is that. And I don't know whose uh, microphone that is, but could you? Uh... Okay. So we can do that. Now, notice what we can do. Let's start writing out some terms. Plug in n equals zero, you get one. Plug in n equals one, you would get i x over one. Plug in n equals two, you get i squared x squared over two factorial. Plug in n equals three, i cubed x cubed over three factorial. Plug in n equals four, i to the fourth x to the fourth over four factorial. Plug in n equals five, i to the fifth x to the fifth over five, 5 factorial. Plug in the 6, x to the 6 over 6 factorial, and so on. Now, in light of what I just told you above, let's replace some of these i cubes and i fourths and all that with different things. i is just i. i squared I know is minus 1. So this would become a minus x squared over 2 factorial. i cubed is minus i, right? Because that's what I had up here. i to the fourth is plus one. i to the fifth is i. And i to the sixth is going to be minus one. Uh, it's five factorial, you wrote six on the last one. Thank you. Now, I'm going to group all the guys that have i's in it and group all the guys that don't. So this is one minus x squared over two factorial plus x four over four factorial 
minus x6 over 6 factorial plus dot dot dot. Over here, I would have x minus x cubed over 3 factorial plus x to the fifth over 5 factorial. The next one would be minus x to the seventh over 7 factorial plus dot dot dot. Now, those of you who, well, we never wrote this out before, so um, maybe you won't see it right away, but uh, for those of you paying attention, that is actually a cosine. This is actually a sine. That has even factorials and only even powers and an alternating sign. That is cosine. And this guy is actually sine. So now look at what happens. If I take the exponential and I plug in an imaginary number into it, it's the same as saying cosine plus i sine theta, i sine x. Later on, we're going to talk about um, later on. I'm going to talk about polar coordinates, and you're going to see like uh, oh, good, you recognize that. Yes, very good. Later, later, we're going to talk about polar coordinates, and you're going to see why something like this is very important. But this is very important. This is what's called Euler's equation. Boom. Now, because it's, it leads to a cosine and sine, sometimes you write it as uh, thetas instead of x. So e to the i theta equals cosine theta plus i sine theta. Someone asks you, what's Euler's equation? Chances are this is the one they're talking about. Now, here's something cool. Pl plug in theta equals pi into this equation. You would get e to the i pi equals cosine pi plus i sine pi. Now, of course, the sine of pi is 0. The cosine of pi is minus 1. So pretty much, we end up with e to the i pi is minus 1, which on one hand is super crazy that that even works out. How is it that I put a complex number into the power of a real number and I get a real number? But that's not what's so marvelous. I could actually move the one to the other side. And I obtain this guy. Now, this guy is called Euler's identity. And it is considered by many people to be the most beautiful equation in all of mathematics. And I mean, just look at it, right? Is it a wonder? I, I, I wrote this equation down and I felt overcome with emotion. So I typed out this entire paragraph. So now you guys are going to listen to me read it. I don't know if it's good, but it's what I felt at the time. <clears throat> don't laugh. I mean, just look at it. Is it any wonder that many esteem it so? First, why would it work? You take a real number, you put a complex number in the power, and the result is a real number. The equation is short, yet it contains the heavy hitters. It has the most important operations in mathematics, if you look. Addition, the inverse of which is subtraction, has multiplication in the power, the inverse of which is division. It has exponentiation, the inverse of which is logging. It has the equality, right? The operation that tells you this is equal to that, right? It tells you who you are, even if you don't look like it in the first place. Then. It contains the most important constants in math. There's the number e, named after the revered Euler. If you raise it to the x power, you get the most important function in mathematics. y equals e to the x is the most important function in all of mathematics. Uh, when you become a math major, you'll see why. And it, e is by extension important, right? Then there's the mysterious i. The number is so enigmatic that we call it imaginary. It is the number such that i squared equals minus 1. And without it, what it means to solve an equation would be woefully incomplete. The fact is, there are polynomials that we would not be able to solve without the complex numbers. And it turns out that with the complex numbers, we can now solve any polynomial in theory to have n roots up to multiplicity. Before the complex numbers, this was not possible. And once you actually have the complex numbers, it turns out that you don't need to invent any other numbers to get an equation to be solvable. 
you can solve any polynomial completely in theory with the complex numbers and there's nothing else that you'd have to invent right so the complex numbers the number i is so important then there's the constant pi which holds the affection and obsession of countless number of enthusiasts then there are the humble numbers zero and one the additive identity and the multiplicative identity of the real numbers respectively now people rarely talk about those no one geeks out over zero and one but without them you wouldn't have a number system they're the unsung heroes and all of those guys, the most important operations in math, the most important constants in math, the most important relationships in math, they're all in one equation. One concise, beautiful equation. It's very short, but it's baffling. It contains centuries of priceless mathematical heritage and pedigree. Zero matters. And that is why that is the most important, the most beautiful equation in mathematics, at least people think so. Very short, very concise, but there's so much packed into that one equation. And it's unbelievable that the most important guys in mathematics actually orchestrate themselves to make such an equation true. Really crazy. Moving on. <laughs> now, this is a generalization of the binomial theorem. Turns out that we learned in algebra class the binomial theorem. Uh, you probably didn't write it as a series at that time, but that's what it is, um, where this guy here is called the binomial coefficient, and you can now read it in terms of factorials. Um, this is the theorem that tells us how to expand binomials. That's why it's called the binomial theorem. So for example, this is the theorem that would tell me that if I take x plus y all to the fourth, it expands like this. Um, it also comes that you can also get this pattern from Pascal's triangle. Start with a triangle of ones, then you go down, you start with a one, then to get all individual numbers, you add the, first, the two numbers above it. So for example, um, if I add one plus one, I would get the two. If I add the one plus two, I would get the three. If I add the one plus two, I would get the three. On the next line, if I add one and three, I get four. If I add three and three, I would get six. If I had three and one, I would get four. Uh, here, if I had one and four, I'd get five. Here, if I had four and six, I get 10, et cetera, right? Now, if you go down, you'll notice that these guys form a pattern. If you look at this line, for example, it tells you what the coefficients are when you expand the fourth power. Notice the, the numbers here, one, four, six, four, one, right? So this is called Pascal's triangle. And this is just a, a picture I stole off Google uh, where some guy wrote it on a chalkboard to emphasize the pattern. So that's the pattern that you want when you want to expand a binomial. And it turns out you can get it by a formula. Now, here's the thing. Under this formula, we always assume n to be some positive number. Um, and the series is finite. But if you extend it, if you think of this, if you expand, if you find the po power series for this, meaning you find a Taylor series expansion for that, you can get the series to be infinitely long. Uh, the formula is going to look very similar. And then you generalize this uh, ex expression. You allow this guy to work even if n is not an integer and beautiful things happen. You now realize that you can expand something to a half power, for example, and you actually will get this series. For example, you can use this formula and I'm not gonna show you how because the details are gonna be kind of gory uh, and I just don't wanna waste the time. You can use that series to expand the square root of one plus x. And it will in fact give you an infinite series. This means, for example, if you take the square root of one plus x squared, you have that series. And now here, many students, of course, and it's a, it's a mistake that I've harped on, uh, distribute, incorrectly distribute powers across some, and they think of the square root of one plus x squared as one plus x. Now, in light of the above, not only are these people infinitely wrong when they write this down, right? Because there's literally an infinite number of terms, and they only wrote down two. But even if I were to think of it as they're approximating it with two terms, they wrote down the wrong answer even then. Because if you were to approximate this guy with two terms, you will actually get a quadratic. It would look like one plus x squared over two. So if a student saw this and they wrote one plus x squared over two, it would actually be better. I would actually be able to say, you know what? They're kind of making more sense, right? And 
do here's something that you should try on your own. Actually graph these guys. Draw a graph of y equals the square root of one plus x squared. And then draw successive terms of this. Start by drawing one plus x squared over two and see how close it fits. Then sketch one plus x squared over two minus x to the fourth over eight. You'll notice that it starts fitting closer. The more terms you graph, the closer the graph is going to fit to the graph of this original one. It's a really cool thing. You should try it on your own. It's gonna be really cool. If you use desmo.com or something like that, graph.tk, and you can do that. Computing limits. I already wrote out the answer for you because again, I don't want to spend too much time on this. Suppose you have this limit. Typical Calc 2 student or Calc 1 student seeing that, they're probably going to go, you know what? L'Hopital's rule. I would need to apply it three times though. Here though, if I recognize the sine function as this series, the x's would cancel and then I'd be able to divide x cubed into everybody and it simplifies to this series. Plugging in x equals zero makes all those guys zero. And the result is minus one over three factorial, minus one sixth. That's the answer. That's actually the answer. And if you were to do derivatives three times, you'll find that's the answer. Uh, here are some more examples for you to try. You can replace e to the x with its series, or replace cosine with its series. Go through here and replace the series for all of these guys. And you're going to realize that you're able to actually simplify things um, very nicely. writing out constants as infinite series. So every now and then you'll see someone write down something like, oh, well, on the contrary, pi is equal to this infinitely long sum. And you, at first you might wonder, well, geez, what a dork, what a geek. You don't have anything better to do with your time. And you might even wonder, well, how are you even gonna use that? Why is that even useful? It turns out it's actually very useful. How do people figure out things like that? Well, series is one way to figure it out. Um, for example, I know e to the x is this, which means if I plug in one for x, it's like plugging in one for x here, which means I can write e as an infinite number. If I add that up, I would get what e is, 2.71828, blah, 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 as it turns out. Um, for example, also, if I ask you to find the power series of arc tangent, I would expect that is something you should be able to do. Why? What you would have done is realize that the integral of one over one plus x squared is arctangent plus c. So what you would do is you would rewrite this to look like one over one minus x. You turn that into a series. It's absolutely convergent. So you switch the integral in the series. It gets this, you integrate, you get a plus c. To figure out what that plus c is, we did an example similar to this in yesterday's class. So I, I feel okay rushing through it. Plug in, in x equals zero, you get arctan of zero on the left side, the series goes to zero on the right side, and you only have c, so you end up with c equals zero, so this c you can ignore. And so arctan of x is this series here. Now what you can do is you can plug in x equals one. On the left side, your arctan of one is going to give you pi over four, and on the right side, you get an infinite series. Multiply both sides by four, and voila you've now written pi as an infinite sum. This automatically tells you pi should be looking like a little less than four. It starts out at four, then you subtract something, but you add something smaller than you subtracted. It makes sense to assume that pi is a little bit smaller than four. Uh, the educated among you will know it's 3.14159. So we can do that application. And finally, we are left with this application, which I'm not even gonna go through, but I encourage you guys to actually try. I might just for the heck of it, put one of these problems on the test just to see who actually tried. You do know enough to do these problems. You're going to go through and you're going to replace these functions with their series versions. Then you're going to integrate the series, plug in the numbers, and then you're able to do the problems. In the part where it asks you to do an estimation, uh, use the alternating series approximation theorem because the alternating series approximation theorem will actually, these guys, when you actually do them, the answer is going to be an alternating series. Yes, challenge accepted. That's why I like to hear. Don't give the machines the power. We need to know how to do this. Anyway, I will see you guys on, well, technically I don't have to see you guys. <laughs> 
Good luck for later. Those are some applications. I just wanted to talk about them because I really think they're cool. Um, however, knowing how to evaluate integrals is what's really important. And I did do a couple examples of that in class. So uh, you guys should be fine there. Uh, do these problems that I have left over here though. And yeah, for now, I think uh, that is, uh, that is it. So we're going to wrap up there. Uh, are there homeworks due this week? I don't remember. What I would say at this point though, is if you're not done with the homework, I would not do, I wouldn't do, spend time on the homework now because it's not going to be as specific a preparation as you would need for the test, right? So for the test, you have uh, things that you can, for the homework, you can use a calculator that might ask you to put in decimals and all sorts of things, um, but you're not gonna be able to do that in the calculator. So the test is on everything up to today, everything up to using a series to evaluate integrals. It's on Saturday uh, between the window of 12 to three, it's an hour and a half long, but you can start at 12, it'll finish early and then you have the rest of the time to upload scans. I'll still send instructions, more specific instructions, either way. We're gonna have like bonus questions on our exam. Yeah. So the bonus questions, I, we pretty much covered everything that I would talk about with series. So the bonus question would either be about 10.9, when would a Taylor series converge, or probably something more like parametric equations. Parametric equations? Yes, and just the basics. And it's, yes, it is on grade scope. And if the homework is due Monday, I wouldn't spend any more time on the homework. Start uh, getting specific practice for your test. So make sure you know the definitions and the strategies. Uh, a lot of problems on your test, like remember, I told you it's gonna be around 20 to 25 problems. A, a, a decent chunk of those would be things that you don't even have to calculate. It's just, do you know the definition? Uh, do you know this concept, right? Things of that sort. Um, select all that apply. It's going to be multiple choice, but for some of them where you have to do computations, write down your work on a piece of paper, scan it afterwards, which shouldn't take you too long if you got those apps on your phones. Um, but yeah, we are, uh, we're going to wrap up right there. Uh, Jason, you still want to see me in office hours? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, all right. I will see you in a bit for everyone else. Uh, take care, and I will see you in the next one. Ciao.